we keep talking about the millions of people affected, uh, whether the people with the disease, their caregivers, the hundreds of billions of dollars of cost, the emotional uh, impact is incalculable. And so clearly, um, the strain on the system is just going to get worse. And it's, by all accounts, probably one of the foremost policy-making challenges out there. So next up, I'm really pleased that we have two senators working on that challenge. Both believe that a coordinated national approach is essential. Maine Senator Susan Collins, uh, she's a Republican. She chairs the Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's. She's going to be with us in a moment. First, I want to welcome Illinois Democrat Senator Dick Durbin. He's leading the charge to fund biomedical research at the National Institutes of Health. He's here to talk about what the federal government can do. And joining him is the Atlantic's Washington editor at large, Steve Clemens. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Shake your hands like this. Wake up. Take your, you, know, you're good, get, get, you all look really foolish, but we're going to have some fun here. Uh, I know it's been a long, uh, intense, and dense morning, so great to be with you. We're with one of the great political leaders in this town. We're going to be joined by one of the other great uh, political leaders, not political leaders, policy leaders, people who are thinking deeply about challenges the country is facing. And it's a real honor here to be with Dick Durbin. Um, and Dick, I just wanted to start out, we were just talking about Animal House. How many of you have seen Animal House? <laughs> this is the guy. Who's, oh, so now you've kind of graduated beyond it. You're living alone. What I want to know is anyone bought the rights to you living alone? <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, and how's Not that as going? Interesting. No sex or violence. It's just, uh, I, well, uh, let me just say it's a different experience to be in an apartment. I think it could be fun. I think there's yeah. a story there, yes. an Atlantic cover story. Uh, in any case, let me start out. You know, one of the interesting things in this, in this kind of broad subject of investment in health science, investment in making the nation uh, a, a healthier place, is you, more than anyone, sort of took an interesting angle that I haven't heard many others take, which is that, that the lack, the deficit of investment in spending actually has strategic consequences for the United States. And I'd like you to take us down that path. It goes back to uh, early experience in the House. Uh, when I was uh, serving on the Appropriations Committee, a fellow named John Porter, congressman from uh, a suburban district in Illinois, joined up with Tom Harkin and Arlen Specter, mm. and they set out to double, double the budget of the National Institutes of Health, and they did it. And I thought to myself, that is an extraordinary feat. And I went out and met with Dr. Collins at NIH, who I think is one of the best, and I said to him, I can't do that in this world. I can't promise you I'll double it. What can I do? He said, 5% real growth a year for hmm. 10 years, and I'll light up the scoreboard. And let me tell you what happens if I don't. If I can't make this investment in research, if we continue to fall behind as we have in the last 10 years when it comes to research at NIH, I won't be able to recruit young researchers. They're dropping off. They've lost faith in the federal commitment to biomedical research. And secondly, he said, we're finding that many countries around the world are going to seize the leadership, the European Union, China, others. Not that there's anything wrong with scientific advancement coming from other countries. We should be sharing this information. But just from a selfish point of view, biomedical research in this country is a dramatic innovator and a dramatic force for economic growth not to mention what it obviously does in sparing human suffering. So I introduced the American Cures Act, and the notion behind it, very simple, 5% a year growth, real growth, for 10 years, NIH, CDC, VA, Department of Defense. There's another side of the piece of this story I might as well add. I had breakfast with Secretary Moniz at the Department of Energy, and I told him this, and he said, um, so, where do you think uh, the folks at NIH and others get the technology that they need for diagnosis? Department of Energy. Turns out mm. it's obvious and right. So my companion bill, the Innovations uh, Act, tries to see 5% real growth in areas like the Department of Science, uh, or the Agency for Science and the Department of Energy. So that's what the motivation was. When you mention China, you think of other large um, sort of states you see around the world that, that uh, increasingly the er area of R&D and high technology is considered a strategic industry, a strategic investment. They're able to amalgamate quite a bit of funding uh, and throw the government behind that, and, and we're walking away from it. How do you, I mean, I understand the bill you put forward, but how would you rate our, 
I, I know you have confidence in your bill, but it, it, I worry, even I remember when I worked for Jeff Bingaman, that we just seem to be derelict in our responsibilities. Well, it, it, it turns out that if you stick with it, that this is one of those amazing political issues. Mm -hmm. I've gone to some extraordinarily conservative Republican colleagues in the House and Senate, and I've said to them, test it. Go into the most conservative audience you can in your district or state and say, let's talk for a few moments about biomedical research and watch what happens. All the politics disappear because every single one of us knows how vulnerable we are. And our vulnerability, the vulnerability of our family, leads us to want to try to find that new drug, that new surgery, that new approach that's going to spare suffering and save lives. There's a dollar sign at the end of this too, but before you reach the dollar sign, it's a very human element. What I'm finding is that more and more uh, from the conservative side of the Republican Party are joining me. Who is my co-chair of the NIH caucus in the Senate? Lindsey Graham. Now, Lindsey and I have a lot of differences politically, but we come together on this. You're going to have a guest here in Susan Collins, who I think is one of the most exceptional senators I've ever served with, and she is passionately committed to this. But what we have to do is reach... Any the, luck with Ted Cruz? Well, I haven't given up. <laughs> haven't given up, you know. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. Um, <laughs> But I really, you know, I approached Roy Blunt, okay? Roy, certifiable conservative Missouri and so forth, and just kept at him. And Lamar Alexander, look what happened when he did his markup on health uh, and labor uh, appropriations bill. He gave a bump of $2 billion to NIH, which is more than 5%. It's 5% plus inflation. You know, pretty darn good. Better than the House, better than the President. And he did it at the expense of a lot of other good things in the bill. Don't get me wrong. I'm not happy with the way he approached it. But he was sensitized by the researchers in, in St. Louis at Barnes Jewish Children's, Washington University, to the need for medical research. And I believe this crosses the spectrum. We have to reach the point where we take the issue of research and innovation and say this is a special consideration of the United States and its future. It's not going to be subject to the same basic budget control rules as other expenditures. Last night, Steve Kornacki um, showed a clip of an interview with Chuck Schumer. And Chuck was talking about how you and he were gym buddies and that you turned Marco Rubio around on immigration and that you used the gym as a hunting ground uh, to, to, to turn people over. So who are some of your targets that you might like to bring on? Do you use the gym? Was Chuck Schumer lying or was he telling no, the he's, truth? No, I go to the Senate gym daily. For yeah, he also said that you said that Republicans go early and Democrats go late. Yes, I tend to be. I, that's why I try to be there first at uh, 530. Uh, I go there every day for no obvious reason. But it's a way to relieve stress. And one of my, the first one in, either right before me or after me, is John Barrasso, mm. you know, orthopedic surgeon from Wyoming. And we talk about these issues. And there's an opportunity there, you know, your guard is down when you're sweating and puffing and all the rest of this stuff, uh, to talk about some of these issues. I've solved some big problems in the gym with my colleagues. I caught them in a vulnerable moment, you know. Uh, and I think approaching this issue on a human side makes a big, big difference. And trying to get just beyond the dollars and cents and talk to people about, for instance, this organization. Harry Johns is here from Chicago, and he and I have mm. uh, met many times and talked about this issue, too. This is reaching into so many families across mm. America, the Alzheimer's challenge. And we see what's coming, the bow wave of not only cost to the government, but cost to the families and what they're going through dealing with Alzheimer's. People are suffering from Alzheimer's. I think there's fertile ground here for political coalition. Sounds great. Uh, one of the interesting things, Susan Collins is going to be joining us midway through, and she has targeted 2025 as a... As, an, as, as the target date that she thinks a, uh, uh, an Alzheimer's treatment should be targeted, calling this a vital national uh, issue and moving around. And you have a, a, a different approach sort of looking at prevention and treatment in, you know, more realistically by 2050. Is, is there a difference in time horizons? When you look legislatively and you talk to scientists, we had the, uh, an incredible woman named Stacy. Uh, Wenninger this morning. Stacy uh, is with a basically raised $217 million in the largest biomedical first round ever. And when you see that amount of money coming into the private sector in Alzheimer's related research or uh, neurodegenerative de research, 
and you look at technology, you look at the fast changing, are we being too modest with the 2050 target? When you think 10 years out, might we be able to achieve more finally than we've ever been able to achieve? I guess it was 40 years after Nixon's war on cancer that we can say we see a 1% decline in cancer mortality mm -hmm. uh, on an annual basis. And I, politicians like to set target dates, you know, that mm -hmm. gives us some, uh, some way to measure how we're doing. But I think the honest, honest answer is we just don't know. Mm. The honest answer. Did you see that Fortune magazine cover story on Alzheimer's? I, it, I spent a lot of time at airports looking at magazine racks. And it jumped right off the rack. It was a cover story about Biogen and Lilly and what they're doing. Mm. And uh, it, it's promising. There have been promises before, but this is promising. Two different drugs, two different approaches. But we, what we know is, uh, for example, when it comes to Lilly, Argonne National Laboratory in, uh, in Ch near Chicago, Lilly virtually has a full-time office there using the advanced photon source, trying to figure out how to match up the drug with the protein in the brain and make it work. I'm a liberal arts lawyer. You can lose me in a second when you get into this conversation. But I do get it that there are certain things that we have, diagnostic, diagnostic tool, tools, also NCATS, I, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's a computing translational science operation. They are now using computers to do millions of tests in a short period of time that used to be unimaginable. So what I'm saying is the pace of change and the pace of discovery is almost impossible to predict. But to set targets and hold politicians to the targets, that makes sense. That's why I picked 10 years, 5% real growth for 10 years. And I, I don't know if that's the right number or what, but I know that if we're incentivized to move toward those targets, we're not going to fall off uh, and, and forget our responsibility. You know, I've, I've heard you speak on so many different topics. You're always passionate. You seem to found the soft point of where legislation might make a difference, whether it's trade policy or technology investment. I got an email a little while ago from Ed Mark Markey's folks in Wired Magazine, and I just... This is gonna be really out of left field, folks, but I can't help it. And it says, has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. It says, Wired demonstrates how a car can be hacked remotely. This might be the kind of software bug most likely to kill someone. So there's actually a former NSA hacker uh, and somebody with Wired Magazine was driving his car at 70 miles an hour and it was hacked. And this is a really sensational uh, text where Ed Markey and Richard Blumenthal are entering, you know, throwing in a, a bill today on the Auto Safety Act. And it made me think that in your world, to sustain interest in any one topic must be so hard. We have a lot of folks here today, not only in this room, but in Washington, coming to sort of elevate the broader discussion on what's going on with Alzheimer's research in this, in this area. But tomorrow, it's hacking a car. The next day, it's something. What, I'm interested from a legislator, from inside, what advice or counsel do you have for people who are, who've been struggling for decades with, with such a dramatic problem on how to sustain interest, sustain, because it seems to me a very difficult challenge given the number of things hitting the, the legislative docket. There's a fellow named Jack Valenti, passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Well known um, man who worked for Lyndon Baines Johnson, became head of the Motion Picture Association. And they once asked him about speeches, and he says, um, there's six words which I always put in a speech, which I think make a difference. And those six words are, let me tell you a story. And when it comes to my world of politics, I've got to get beyond the numbers and the statistics and tell you a story about a person affected by something. I have found that to be the most dramatic way to bring issues home to people so that they understand them. How many stories do we have in this room? Thousands. Mm. And what you need to do is make sure that your member of Congress or some trusted staffer hears those stories and understands what it means to a family, uh, what they've been through. When we debated Obamacare and I stood out in the street in front of my office in Springfield, Illinois, with the Tea Party people raging away, they finally said, stop telling stories. <laughs> because I had them. Every time they were gonna dismiss this as big government, I said, well, let me tell you about the person who couldn't get insurance, lives over in Rochester. Stop telling stories. The point I'm getting to is no matter what the issue, and this one especially, because how poignant and touching and personal it is, the story of medical research has so many different chapters. Make sure that member of Congress understands one. 
I worked for years, still have, on the Dreamers, uh, trying to help those undocumented kids brought to the United States who grew up here. And it was partisan, but I can recall sitting down with Kay Bailey Hutchison trying to work out an agreement on something, and she turned to her staffer and said, will that help Maria if we do it this way? It was a story that she heard and remembered and brought her to the negotiating table. So never stop telling the stories. Now you're a member of the Bipartisan Task Force uh, on Alzheimer's Disease. How many members are there? I, I can tell you, I don't know the exact number, but it is in excess of 40. Mm -hmm. when, not bad. When we had the budget resolution on the floor, <clears throat> I took all the medical research amendments and all the Democrats and Republicans and said, let's put it in one amendment, put everything in one amendment. Susan went along with it. She had the, the Alzheimer's amendment, mm -hmm. a specific one. And we had, I think, 42 or 43 who had co-sponsored uh, amendments when it came to medical research. Now we were all together, Democrats and Republicans. And that's the way this works. Uh, and that's the way you build the coalition that can pass something. So what is structurally going on? Because when you look at other chronic diseases, you look at heart disease, you go, Alzheimer's has got the largest footprint out there in the country of affected Americans, and the costs are the highest, as I understand them, are among the highest of all these. But the level of research uh, dollars that the, that the federal government spends is, is, is really a pathetic, sort of a third or less of what you see going into sort of similar rates of things. And I'm just interested structurally, what do you think is happening in the Alzheimer's field that has made it difficult to step those numbers up? That's a good question. And I, I really would address it to Dr. Collins because I've asked it of NIH as long as I've been in the House and the Senate. Mm. How do you pick your research issues and research projects? And, you know, we're near a cure. It's, it's a deadly disease. It affects children, Th things like that. And by and large, you say, it sounds like all the above when you get right down to it. I don't know, and I don't know how to measure. You know, the AMP program, you're probably familiar with the AMP program. Alzheimer's was identified as one of the uh, medical diseases that they're going after in this new partnership between pharma and NIH. That's a pretty good sign. And this kind of directed, specific investment research may turn out to be more productive than a lot of other things. So I wouldn't dismiss mm. it just by dollar amount. Also understand, when I talk about the advanced photon source being so important uh, to Lilly in developing a do, I believe that's mm. their drug, I think I've got that right. The advanced photon source is so important to them. Who would have guessed that was biomedical research when we were developing it 10, 20, 30 years ago? But it is, and so there are many tangential things which come into the whole quest to find the answer. So what is the, I mean, when you think about, you've talked about conservatives and going in to talk about my medical, and I, I would imagine that would be very, very compelling. I'm, my family's from Oklahoma and Kansas. You went in there, you had that discussion, there would be support. So who is the opposition that, that needs to be taken down? Well, the opposition is not specific. It's taken down. The opposition <laughs> is not specific. Let me give you an example. My bill the American Cures Act, 5% real growth in the four agencies I mentioned to you, over a 10-year period of time costs $150 billion. It is likely that we will spend in the neighborhood of $20 trillion on our federal budgets during that period. $150 billion, wow, big sum of money. $20 trillion gets smaller, doesn't it, when you put it in comparison. So I, th I started thinking about how are we going to pay for it, Durbin? It's great to have these ideas. How are you going to pay for it? Well, for the longest time, I've had this... Um, uh, Smoking. Yes, thing against tobacco. And the fact that... I knew that. I've got notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the fact that you don't face smoking on airplanes. It was mm. a bill that I passed in the House, Frank Lautenberg. Round the of Senate, applause. Long time ago. Yeah. The, so I said, you know, let's, let's get real here. Yeah. Dollar a pack. And it's going to go to medical research. That pays for half of what I just described to you, the 5% real growth. And I went to a, I'm not going to name names, but a conservative Republican senator who by his... Oh, I'm going to give it away. I don't want to give it away. Texas. By his religious uh, oh. preference, hates tobacco. So I said, here's the thing. Medical research, up 5%. I'm with you. I'm with you. Dollar on tobacco. No way. Why? No taxes. I don't vote for taxes. Is that a Grover Norquist column? It's a, it's a people who've signed this mindless pledge. pledge. Even on tobacco. On tobacco. And mm. I said, but your state and other states are doing this already. Republican-led legislators and legislatures and governors. No, I took the pledge. So it isn't as if people are uh, Luddites or opposed to science and, and progress. They sign themselves up 
for restrictions on their power as a senator and congressman to appeal to certain constituencies. I'm never going to sign those pledges. I think you need to have the flexibility to make the right decision for America's future. Do you think there's a tension uh, in the, in, from, from your perspective, because we've been talking about research, but it's also about living. You know, one of the things I'm going to talk to Susan Collins about is living with this, caretake, caretakers. Um, and I'm interested in what the Affordable Care Act, and to a certain degree, what is the social contract uh, as you feel it, between our government and, and, and civil society and those people living with this disease? Because we're talking about research, which may not help many of those with this. And does that come up in discussion? Each of us kind of comes... are huge. Again, I'm not going to... I guess I'm going to tell you a story. But each of, us, each of us comes to this with our life experience. If you have ever been a new father of a sick child and didn't have health insurance... You'll never forget it as long as you live. Hmm. I was one. Hmm. I was a student at Georgetown Law, just a few blocks from here. Brand new wife and baby and no health insurance. And my daughter had a problem. And I set, I'd leave the law school classes, pick up my wife and baby, and head over to Children's and sit in the room for people who had no health insurance. Hmm. Uh, and wait to see who walked through the door. I had a number. And I was hoping whoever came through the door was a competent medical professional could save my daughter's life. You'll never forget that as long as you live. And that's why I think that health insurance and that peace of mind mm. is a basic right that we should establish in America. This shouldn't just be a question of whether you're lucky or rich. This ought to be part of who we are as a nation. It ought to define mm. us as a nation. And so when you get into this conversation about the role of government, that's where I come from. Mm. And it comes from a life experience. Affordable Care Act, most important domestic vote I ever cast. 16 million Americans now have access to health insurance. The number of uninsured down by 30%. The rate of growth, the rate of growth in health care costs is still an incline, but it's flattening just enough to give 13 more years of solvency to the Medicare system. I mean, we can see this is working. It's transforming the delivery of medical services. And there are 16 million, or I'd say 10 or 11 million, fathers not sitting in those rooms without health insurance, praying that the right doctor walks through the door. So I want to go to the audience and, and ask some questions before Senator Collins gets here, but I want to ask you um, one unfair question. Not the first. <laughs> if, if, if you were in the seat that President Obama has, how would you deal with this political environment differently than he has? What would you do that he's not? What needles would you move that he's not? How would you deal with that task of making the nation healthier? Well, I think uh, he will be remembered for this Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. having survived two constitutional challenges in the Supreme Court. And we've soldiers on through some impossible challenges. How about the rollout <laughs> and all the things we went through there? So I, I believe this is going to be ranked number one or two in terms of his legacy, but it, we still have a year and a half to go, in terms of his legacy. How could he have done it differently? Good question. Um, I, I really I encouraged him on, to take the American Cures Act and make it part of his presidential um, platform and budget. He hasn't quite done that. But he is moving in more and more medical research, precision medicine, for example, which really tries to take the Human Genome Project and these diseases and tailor make what individuals need you know, he, I think, is a great communicator, a great messenger, uh, and I would hope that he'd spend more time on this medical research issue. Interesting. Good answer. Wait, who is it? Oh, Senator Collins. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. Come join our living room here. Come on in. Senator Susan Collins with me. Hey, Susan. How are you? Uh, yeah, Susan, thank you for joining us. We thought we'd just kind of mix it up a little bit. We're going to get rid of him soon. I love soon, your blue but, dress. Uh, yeah, he said such <laughs> nice things about you. Um, but let me, let me just take a couple of quick qu questions for Senator Durbin before he needs to run off. Yes, right here. Do we have a microphone? Can we toss it over fast? How are you? Fine, thanks. We're going to have fun, I promise. Yes. Hi. My name's Lorna Abernathy, and I am on both sides of um, helping the Alzheimer's Association raise money through um, my national sorority, but I'm also a caregiver to my father who's 88 and has Alzheimer's. And I, um, my challenge is 
we are raising money, and mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful for research because I would don't want any other family to go through what we are being mm -hmm. going through with my father. But at the same time, I want to be able that my father lives a life of dignity because up until this point, he was a very active gentleman, very happy, very um, charismatic. Where does the money come from, and how do we get the different nursing homes and care facilities and in-home care to meet the requirements to continue to treat people with dignity? Because I feel that, as we've been talking to some of the other caregivers mm -hmm. before, that that's one of the things. There's no, there's no standard. It's a very high turnover in rate. I've been very fortunate and have found an amazing place for my father that I hope others can find, but then I hear horror stories about what is out there. And when you talked about the Affordable Care Act and health care and how we all deserve it, I also think people who have served in the war, as my father had, and you know, supported his family since he was 14, right. he right. still has a level of care. Thank you. So, and we're going to also discuss this with Senator Collins because she's been investing so much in this area, but, but Dick? I'm going to hand it off to her, not because it's, uh, I can't answer it, but she can answer it better. Susan has introduced a piece of legislation which gets right to the heart of your question. Thank you, Dick. And first, let me thank you for hosting this forum and also say that there's no better advocate in the United States Senate than Dick Durbin for biomedical research. And it's been a great pleasure to work with you, Dick, on this issue that both of us care so much about. Just a week ago, Senator Baldwin and I introduced a National Caregivers uh, Act. And the reason that we did so is exactly to answer some of the concerns that mm. you've just raised. We are spending $225 billion on caring for people with Alzheimer's. The majority of that is uncompensated care that exhausted family members are giving, mm. frequently an, an elderly spouse. And we don't have a strategy for trying to ensure that caregivers have the support that they need, whether it's respite care, whether it's home health care, mm. whether it's uh, support groups. And that's what our bill is aimed at. It, it is modeled on the National Alzheimer's Plan Act, which mm. I authored with former Senator Evan Bayh. And that has produced a national strategy for Alzheimer's. It's brought together all the federal agencies and its most important recommendation has to do with the appropriate level of funding for biomedical research. Let me get this gentleman right here. Stuart Rosenthal with the Beacon Newspapers. Senator, I commend your, your legislation to bring more money to federal research, and I think there will be a breakthrough from it in the ne next few years. My question is, you're asking how to pay for it. Why is it that when the government develops these kinds of, of, of basic research things that the, the drug companies pay very little in terms of license fees, and that they give no break to Medicare on the cost of the drugs when they're ultimately provided to the taxpayer that funded it in the first place. Why can't Congress do something great, about great that? Great question. There's no reason why pharma shouldn't pay more. The investment they're making in the AMP program is modest, modest in terms of real dollars. We hope that even that modest investment will lead to some uh, public-private pri breakthrough here on Alzheimer's. But I think there are places to turn that are not unreasonable. And certainly pharma is large, it's important, uh, but its revenues and resources suggest that it can be part of the solution here when it comes to medical research. People will ultimately benefit from this research, but usually pharma will benefit first. Uh, they'll develop these new products. And when I read this Fortune magazine piece, I sent a copy of it out to Francis Collins, and I said, it never mentions NIH once in the entire article. Did you have anything to do with what's going on at Biogen and Lilly? He sent me a memo with 10 different elements of what basic research at NIH led to these developing these new experimental drugs. So there's a, there's a linkage there. And I, I think engaging pharma in funding some of this research. But if I could, I mean, this is a bit, we had a pre-session this morning with Stacy Weninger 
who is uh, the person who raised $217 million for, for this first round company, Denali, working on neurodegenerative research. What interest, interested me about the amount of money, which was very large, which is one third of the entire budget of what the, you know, the $666 million they put in. But in that, when you talk to her about this funding gap between those in the lab who develop innovative research and getting to market, those that invest early are usually wiped out in the way equity is diluted. And so there's a structural bridge that's not being met by most. And so to, to just say that pharma should do that doesn't necessarily figure out the incentive problem, right? I'm not saying do it alone. Yeah. That they would be an element in this, I think, would be important and makes sense from their business model. Hmm. Uh, but I really view this whole research question, not just biomedical research, but related research, to be the kind of commitment America needs to make in this 21st century. Look at our competition. They get it. Mm -hmm. What China is doing now in research China and fills and the bridge. Absolutely. With a lot of, lot of they concrete. They see this coming. They want to be dominant. Mm -hmm. They want to, if 20th century was the American century, they want the 21st to be the Chinese century. And we'd better wake up to this reality. And as I said earlier before you got here, I'm not opposed to finding the cure for Alzheimer's in China and using it in the United States. Don't get me wrong. But we have established here but it's a I strategic think, industry. A strategic yeah. industry that produces so much. What we did in mapping the Human Genome Project has been paid back to us 150 times over for every dollar spent in, that, in doing that, and it will continue to. So it is an economic driver, not just uh, morally. Susan, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just want to encourage us to look at this in a broader way. Alzheimer's is our nation's costliest disease. It is going to bankrupt Medicare and Medicaid if we do not invest in the research. The Alzheimer's Association has said that if we could delay the onset by even five years, it pays for the increase in research. So I think this is one of these issues where we're looking at it far too narrowly, because if you look at Alzheimer's as our costliest disease, if you look at the return on investment, if you look at the tsunami of cases that we're going to be facing just because of the changing demographics of our country, we can't afford not to make this investment. Oh, yes, you're waiting for Senator Durbin? Oh, okay. <laughs> Senator Durbin, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Big thank round you. of Senator thank Durbin. You. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Dick. Thank you. Susan, come join me here. Great to see you, Dick. Remember our deal about your, uh, uh, the rights on your living alone. I think there's a story there. We were just talking about him moving from Animal House into his own place. <laughs> And there had to be something in there about his sort of daily routine. We were also talking a little bit about last night, Steve Kornacki had done a, an interview with Chuck Schumer. And, and he talked, Schumer talked a little bit about his going to the gym uh, with Dick. And they, they would target Republicans at the gym to sort of seduce over to whatever legislative game they had. Do you, do you work that way yourself? I, of course, have a far more direct approach. <laughs> <laughs> I just bring people facts and then badger them until they agree with me. You know, I, <laughs> I spent much of last night actually reading about the volume of things that you have done, not only Alzheimer's research, but in aging, aging in place. Uh, you know, I was just reading tweets of yours that on diabetes and, and, the, and the whole broad arena of how to think about designing homes differently uh, for the aging in place. You must know more about this subject than any of your colleagues. It's just I'm convinced that's the case. Would I, you say that's the case? <laughs> no, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be that but, I mean, presumptuous. But, but, but you've, you've invested heavily in I this. I have. What's driven that? I have. Well, first of all, I have the privilege of chairing the aging committee. So... It's in but, but my some, responsibility. But somebody called you that for, I mean, you wanted that job. But right? absolutely. I represent the state with the oldest median age in the country. 
Um, so you if you probably... had the youngest median age, you wouldn't do this committee assignment? <laughs> no, I would still do it, but that certainly is an added So incentive. what about you but is also, driving you this direction? But also, um, I meet constituents every day, including members of my own family, mm -hmm. who are struggling with the issues that one of your mm -hmm. questioners uh, brought up. Mm. Maine is a low-income state. We have a lot of rural elderly whose families have moved away, and we need to figure out a way to make sure that their needs are met. The statistics on Alzheimer's are really a call to action for all of us. Mm. What we're learning from the experts is by age 85, and many of us are going to live till at least 85, nearly one out of two of us will develop Alzheimer's or some other kind of dementia, and the other one's gonna be taking care of that person. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a real call to action. And- Are people hearing it? Finally, due to great advocacy, and to some of the stigma, which I've never understood, that's been connected yeah, what, what, what with is Alzheimer's. stigma thing? I don't know. I don't understand it. But, you know, I grew up in an era where people didn't say that they had cancer. It would be whispered hmm. that she had the big C. And I didn't understand that either. And with Alzheimer's, there's been, for some reason, this desire to keep it hidden within families. And I think that's really changed, and mm. that's what has helped us make progress. And as Dick may have already said, we made tremendous progress in the appropriations bill this mm. year. We've only been funding Alzheimer's at, a, at the highest level, it's been about 600 million dollars. This is for a disease that costs our society as a whole $226 billion, $153 billion is out of Medicare and Medicaid, and yet we were only investing $600 million. This year, we got a 60% increase in the Senate version of the appropriations bill to bring us up to $950 million. We should be at two billion. That would be that's what the experts tell us. That would still be less than one percent of what we're spending. Wow. But that's huge progress to have a sixty percent increase. You know, Dick Durbin was just sharing with us, because I was I was asking, are we at a different inflection point in in technology and history, what we can do? And and he was pretty modest because I was sort of looking at his target for dealing and treating with Alzheimer's at 2050 and yours of 2025. And you got your colleagues to basically saw, you know, pass something saying this is a vital national priority and you can't wait on a vital national priority. Let's move up the date. And it occurs to me, you've served in the Senate for 18 years. And when I think back 18 years ago, we didn't have gadgets like this. Right. We didn't have all of the, 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 the embedded sensors, the wearables, all of the data management that we seem to be having today. Do you feel in your long service to the country that, that all the stuff you, 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 you sit inside the center of the Wizard of Oz, do you, do you, do you, or, or Oz, do you see in the crystal ball something very different in the next six to 10 years by 2000? I, I do. So give us, tell us why, give us some in, I, benchmarks. Be, because I have talked to so many researchers I spent a fascinating two hours at Mass General one day with their top Alzheimer's research, mm. and they are making real progress. And it takes money, it takes money. But no matter where you look, whether it's Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor, Maine, or Mass General, or the University of Pennsylvania, all across the United States, there finally is a focus on Alzheimer's in a way that leaves me very optimistic that we're either going to find more effective treatments, that'll mm. probably come first, 
but ultimately either a means of prevention or a cure. It's the only one of the top 10 most deadly diseases for worse. which we don't have any. And yeah, right, and the worse. trajectory is frightening. And here's what makes me optimistic. When HIV AIDS came on the scene, we really invested and focused like a laser. And look at the breakthroughs mm -hmm. that we have made in treatment of people with HIV AIDS. It's just amazing. And it happened, if you think about it, really pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But it was because there was this concentrated effort, a national strategy, and the investment. We still spend $3 billion a year on HIV AIDS compared to the meager 600 million, soon I hope to be 950 million for Alzheimer's. So to me, that shows the effectiveness of a concentrated effort. We, I had a wonderful conversation this morning with, with a woman I just mentioned who'd raised all this money for a biomedical uh, company called Denali. And she said that she was sort of sick of mice. That, uh, uh, and, and what she was trying to say is that in mice, we can show that we've cured mice of Alzheimer's, but the translatability of that to what we're dealing with is so limited and there's so many problems. And she made two really interesting points. One was that the stigma issue or something out there is still limiting those people willing to step forward to have sort of genetic markers done and given and to get into the population pool that they would need. She said hundreds of thousands of people is what they would ideally need over a period of time to map this better. And the second is, she said, we have a ridiculously low uh, tolerance for risk in the Alzheimer's area. But if you're having a heart, trans, you know, heart uh, uh, valve procedure or you're having other procedures in which you know, the risks are high, people take them. But in Alzheimer's, there seems to be you know, a, a barrier to that. Have you thought a little bit about the, that dimension of both risk and population pools? I have. Uh, one of the hearings that we held on Alzheimer's, we had B. Smith, the mm. restaurateur model, oh, come right. testify. And she sadly has early onset of Alzheimer's. Mm. And one of the wonderful things that she has done is a public service announcement reaching out to African Americans in mm. particular because they are not participating in clinical trials. Mm. And she is encouraging their participation in clinical trials. I've had members of my own family participate in a very unsuccessful clinical trial for mm. Alzheimer's. But we need people uh, to think not only about themselves, but the next generation. Yesterday, I met with two constituents who were struggling with early onset Alzheimer's, which is the saddest of mm. kinds of Alzheimer's. And there are genes that have now been identified mm. for early onset, and so that you can get tested for it. And they talked about the dilemma of their 29-year-old daughter who is about to get ma married. And she can't decide whether to get tested or not. She can't decide whether she wants to have children or not because she feels if she doesn't get tested, mm -hmm. she shouldn't have children. That's a horrible dilemma for someone to be in. Right. And I think it causes people, when there isn't an effective treatment or a cure, to be hesitant about getting tested for genetic markers. Hmm. Because they think, well, if nothing can be done, do I really want to know? And I think that the more that we can get people to participate in testing and clinical trials, the more we'll know and the sooner we'll get to But our counseling goal. might be a part of that. Absolutely. And I think also, though, helping people um, understand the benefit mm. for the next generation. 
You know, I was thinking about the Senate. You know, one of the things that you think about, you know, Pete Domenici stepped forward on brain research and, yes. and, and has had difficulties. So former Senator Domenici is someone I had the privilege to know um, well in the 1990s. But when I think back and you go back and look at a number of the senators who have passed, a number of them likely had Alzheimer's or some form, but not reported, that Correct. people hid it. They didn't talk about it. It wasn't disclosed. But I know of some cases. Do you think, I mean, the Senate is like a family after a certain period of time, right? Whether you like, I mean, yes. sometimes unwanted family. <laughs> uh, but, but, but they're a family nonetheless. And do you think that more of those stories, that there ought to be an effort somehow for people to come out, come out with their stories? Would that be a healthy thing to help other people around the country do some of the things you're talking about? It would be, and I'll tell you a person that I so greatly admire is Maria Shriver, right. who uh, has been very vocal about her father's fight with Alzheimer's. And I remember when she testified, and it was so poignant because she said that he remembered every word of the Hail Mary, the prayer. Um, that we Catholics say, and yet couldn't remember her name. Mm. And that, when I heard that, it was so heartbreaking. But having people like B. Smith, mm. like Maria, come forward and tell their personal stories or their family's stories is very important. But it's very hard because sometimes those family members still want it not to be known. And so part of our job is to do more forms like this mm -hmm. and to encourage people, particularly celebrities, to tell their story. We had Glenn mm -hmm. Campbell come oh, right. and testify before us. And that was wonderful. And she, he played some of his music for me mm. before going on with his daughter's help. And music had stayed with him. And I've seen that with members of my family struggling with Alzheimer's, that music seems to still stay with them. Well, I don't know if Alzheimer's was part of it, but you had Richard Gere up there playing an elder man who was homeless as right. well. And so there's an element of homelessness being lost, not being connected, yes. uh, that's part of this as well. And so working through those celebrities per se helps you kind of broaden the story. So let me ask you a, a couple of unfair questions. <laughs> who, I mean, let, to, to be honest, I mean, there are probably some Democrats who are not big on science and got Ds or Fs in science, but there seem to be a lot more in your party. And, <laughs> you know, and no, that's not a, that's not right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, I accept it. My point is, 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 so science, though, the solvency of science, the investment in science, the belief that science can deliver something there, this seems to be a point of contention with some of your colleagues. Is, is, it is, well, one, is that true? And two, is there a way to bring over? I mean, Dick Durbin was talking about going and taking the most conservative members of the caucus, and I know he wanted to say anti-science, but he didn't. Uh, but, but, taking them, go talk about biomedical research with your constituents, and you will see them come alive. And he said that's happened. So I'm interested in this debate about science and health and investment, and whether that is, is a challenge for you with, with your colleagues in your caucus. Well, the best answer I can give you is the Republicans are in control of the Senate. And for the first time ever, we've had a 60% increase in Alzheimer's funding. Very good answer. <laughs> so, so who is, I mean, I mean, you make such a compelling case about the footprint of this problem, about it's a national, really a national security issue uh, for the nation, at least on the domestic front. Um, Dick Durbin talks about it being a strategic area of strategic necessity. What's, what's, the, what's the problem in bringing more colleagues on more quickly? What, what is the barrier? What are they distracted by? Well, there are a lot of serious diseases in this country. And it, it took a while to get a focus on cancer research, which we spend $5.4 billion on a year. And it's paid dividends. I think we need to look at the successful investments in cancer research, in HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. 
in cardiovascular disease. There's not an awareness of the prevalence of Alzheimer's. Now that's partially because people used to die earlier. Right. Right. And also remember when it was, you know, people would say, well, she's just gotten senile. Do you remember that term? Right. And people didn't realize that Alzheimer's was a disease. Mm. They thought it was just something that happened as people got older. So that's why I commend all the advocacy groups, the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Association, and the many Alzheimer's, uh, U.S. Against Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's Cures, and all these groups, because raising public awareness is absolutely critical to mm -hmm. getting the kind of support that we need and that has been there for other diseases that have organized, powerful advocacy groups that are willing to mm. speak out. And that's what we need to do. But it's changing. I've been the chair of the Alzheimer's Task Force in the Senate for years. Senator Clinton mm. was my first co-chair. I've always made it bipartisan. Well, it's been quite a while since she's been in the in the Senate. Right, right. And so back then, it was really difficult mm. to get people interested. Now I have people clamoring to be the co-chair. Now wow. Senator Warner's a co-chair. Senator Toomey is a co-chair. Senator Markey is a co-chair. That's a real difference, and that matters in terms of our ability to bring bipartisan So you mentioned here. Hillary Clinton. Um, we are entering a political season, and just about everyone you know is running for president. Yes. Um, do you think there's a chance? I don't know Donald Trump. I want to put that on the record. <laughs> But in that, do you think there's a responsible way to elevate something like Alzheimer's yes. research in the presidential? That we seem to be talking about a lot of silly stuff. But is there a chance to bring some some of the serious health issues into broader discussion? Yes. And, and how would you recommend doing it? Let me give you a great example. Uh, Jeb Bush called me and asked for my support. I am endorsing Jeb Bush, but I took the opportunity to talk to him about Alzheimer's disease. I just want to say that's a I tweet. I had him that's on a, the phone. For those of you tweeting, that is a tweetable moment, probably the most <laughs> tweetable moment. So put, you know, Jeb Bush is out there, and you know, I would link to him, and I would ask Jeb Bush to comment. And here's the good thing. Just a few weeks later, he talked publicly mm. about Alzheimer's disease, about his mother-in-law's uh, battle with Alzheimer's and the need for more investment. So see, it works. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, um, regardless of who you're supporting for president, ask them what is their position on Alzheimer's. Encourage them to make it part of their platform, their agenda and push them to speak publicly about it. That's what we need. Wow. And it worked in my case. That's great. Let me go to the audience in just a moment, but the other thing that you've spent a lot of, of, of your time thinking about, which hasn't really entered our national discussion as much as it is aging in place. Yes. And I'm really interested in how you think about that. What do you think we as a country need to get right in that, in that arena? What are the doable, uh, things that we should try to check off the box because it's not, it's beginning to percolate but not widely discussed. Well, I'm going to give my parents credit mm -hmm. on this. When they built their house, two story house in 1957, they were smart enough to put a master bedroom and bathroom on the first floor. And I'm one of six children, and they closed off the top floor. Mm. They left one as a guest bedroom when we come visit. But I cannot imagine how they had the foresight back in 1957 to think about their ability mm. to climb stairs. And when my father had his two knees replaced, one one year and one the next, 
it wasn't an issue for them. Mm. Um, I happened to have broken my ankle last December, and the mm. house I live in, thank goodness, has one of those automatic chairs that goes up a back staircase. Just happened little, to have one? Yes, yeah. <laughs> when I bought it. Little would I have guessed that I was going to be the one to, to use it. And, um, but it was going to the University huh. of Maine, which has a whole program to help people age in place. And they went out huh. to assisted living houses, uh, places, and interviewed seniors. They interviewed 50 seniors and said, what do you need? And it wasn't just stairs mm. by any stretch. It was sensors. Mm. It was all sorts of indicators um, where they could be connected to their loved ones. Now, I will tell you, there were privacy issues here that had to be dealt with. But we're a long ways from the old, I've fallen and I can't get up medical <laughs> alert button. And, and it was from them that I realized you could redesign living spaces mm and renovate living spaces so that there would be a sensor if you didn't close the refrigerator door right. or if you left the stove on or just better pathways through your house if you're losing your vision through mm. macular degeneration. So it's a really exciting area and let's face it, most of us want to stay in the comfort, security, and privacy of our own homes. And we've got to do a better job using technology to make that possible. There are also huge cost benefits mm. of being able to live in your own home. So we had a hearing on this issue, too. And we had someone come in who compared the cost of institutionalized care in a nursing home versus redesigning and putting sensors that would allow better connection to an adult child. And it was I, wonderful. I can't imagine. I was talking to Amy Klobuchar the other night about you, and she said there's just no one who knows this world. But I can't imagine anyone telling you no if they ask you to, <laughs> to uh, work on a bill. Let me open the floor to our guest. This is a, a great, yes, right up here in front. And we're going to get you a microphone. Shireen, just throw it. No, I'll just... <laughs> it's Richard Harris. Uh, I'm with uh, Next Avenue. Yesterday, I had a, a nice conversation with um, Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General. Yes. Uh, right. He was a member of the Alzheimer's Study Group, which came out in 2009 with a report uh, that was supposed to be a wake-up call, uh, you know, a clarion call about all the statistics that you mentioned, that Dr. Johns mentioned, that other people have mentioned. Um, and I asked him the question that Steve just asked you, which was, if all this is true and we're facing the tsunami of cases and we have a fraction of the research money that's going to this case, why is that? Well, what, what is the mm. problem? And he, he doesn't know the answer, but one theory he has, and I'd love to get your opinion, is Unlike HIV AIDS, which more or less affected younger people, his theory is that one reason for the slow response is that this disease, unfortunately, affects older people. And he also made the point that many of those older people who are obviously afflicted with the disease don't vote. To what degree, it doesn't explain everything, but to what degree do you think it explains some of what's going on in terms of the slow response to the need for funding for Alzheimer's? Can, can I piggyback on that? With the self-awareness that we're all going to have at some point about our own health frame, our genetic makeup, I'm thinking of having my genes sequenced, it's about a thousand bucks is the question of whether that changes the stakeholding in that or not. Like if you know 15 to 30 years before you're in that, does, does it change that? But go ahead, Susan. Well, first I have to tell a story about Dr. Satcher. 
um, whom I got to know when I first came to the Senate and he was Surgeon General. It turned out that he had done an Institutes of Medicine study with my uncle who practiced in Maine for many years wow. and who has since died of Alzheimer's. And uh, so I think the world of Dr. Satcher, I don't agree with him in this case because any of you who have had a family member with Alzheimer's know that it affects the entire mm. family. It does not just affect the victim. Mm. It affects the grandchild whose name is no longer remembered. It affects the spouse mm. who's trying to deal with a husband and wife who's for the first time yelling at them and won't bathe. It affects everybody. So um, having seen this very close, upfront and personal, I, I don't think it's because it's a disease of the elderly. I think it was because for years it was hidden or people died earlier, or it was, well, she's senile. And, you know, we didn't understand that it was a disease, even though that work's been done for years. But think of the difference. Right. And, and Dr. Johns would tell you, the difference in the last five years on public awareness is mm. remarkable. When the Alzheimer's Association bring those purple-clad advocates uh, to town. I always have a hearing that day because it fills up the mm. entire hearing room and wow. it's important visually for people to know it. I'm sorry, you... It's not no, you've good, answered my question by saying it, that we're all in, in the yes. game, so it's not there. Let me take one last question. Comment. Yes, right over here. I, along with so many other people in this room, want to personally thank you, Senator Collins, for everything you're doing. You're just an amazing advocate. Um, I also want to ask you, um, and knock it up a notch, um, Harry Johns this morning talked about presidential candidates. Steve brought it up again. But I'm wondering if, um, in the words of Jim Pinkerton, who's a, a wonderful journalist, he said that we need to declare war worldwide war on Alzheimer's. And I'm wondering if you have worked with any foreign leaders or your other counterparts in trying to address this in a much more global way. Excellent question, and the answer is yes. Um, Great Britain had an international conference. I was, but last year, I was invited to it and to speak at it. I desperately wanted to go. Um, but the Senate schedule plus mm. my campaign schedule precluded me from doing so. But I, it, George Breidenberg has brought in people uh, to meet with me internationally because we do need an international approach and we need to pool resource, resources and research. And one thing issue I feel strongly about is that if you get federal funding for Alzheimer's research, you should be required to share is your results. Is that the results. case today? Not always. Mm. Um, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I'm told that some of it is deemed proprietary if it's in conjunction with a pharmaceutical company, which it often is. And, and of course, there's the new AMP initiative also where there's a modest, it's pretty modest investments from both sides. And that one is going to be published, as I recall. But it seems to me that ought to be a minimum. But hmm. I agree, we need an international approach. This problem is only going to grow worse across the world. And there are countries like in Western Europe and Japan where the population is aging uh, that should be particularly interested in a collaborative approach. I would just say in closing, this last point about the sharing of data, of research, as long as the 
the uh, privacy issues are worried out. In, in the Atlantic's many forums in the health area, it's the single thing that comes up the most. But whether it's hospital to hospital, we, we did a thing up in Cambridge with, had, had several cancer researchers from Harvard top saying we don't share in the way we should. And they'll say that, that the absence of protocols and, and a sort of commitment to share very broadly is the biggest inhibitor. Everybody says it's getting better, but it's not where it should be. So I really appreciate that, that last comment. Thank Susan, you. thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank Susan you. Collins, thank the you. awesome Senator of Maine, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.